There's a new barbarian subclass in Bigby's Glory of the Giants called appropriately Path of the Giant, and we're going to be exploring it today. Like most barbarians, unless you're going to level 20, it could benefit from some multi-classing. I found that a few fighter levels can really benefit a barbarian to get a fighting style and action surge, and if you want more levels, Battlemaster can add a lot of power to a barbarian. Trip attack and menacing attack in particular are the sort of things I want my barbarian doing. That being said though, this subclass stands just fine on its own. The mid and high level abilities are good, and since we're going to 20th level, the Barbarian Capstone suits this subclass perfectly. Since this is a brand new subclass, we want to showcase it by not doing any multi-classing and showing what it's capable of. Hi everyone, and welcome to a titanic episode of The, the Dungeon, Dungeon Crashers. Crashers. I'm Guy. And I'm Zapeel. Before we get started, remember to like this video, subscribe to our channel, and if you haven't already, turn on notifications so you don't miss any of our exciting D&D content. As Guy said, we are building the Path of the Giant Barbarian. This subclass is all about being big and strong, and throwing things, which is great. Thrown weapons haven't got a lot of love in 5e, and it's good to see that changing. The abilities from Strike of the Giants also work with thrown weapons, and we'll be using that as well, and we are going to lean into throwing things as part of this build. But we aren't going to neglect beating people with heavy objects either, so let's get into it. We are going to be using the Variant Human for the race, primarily because we want the first level feat, but it also suits this character we want to build. Instead of the racial features other races get, humans get one bonus skill and one bonus feat. This seems kind of weak on the surface considering some of the great abilities other races get, but feats are very strong and can help create an entire character archetype if you can get them at first level. A lot of the newer backgrounds also give feats, including the one that we are taking, but still getting two is better than just getting one. For the skill, we are taking Athletics. Being strong is this character's main attribute, and for the feat, we are taking Tavern Brawler. It allows us to increase his strength or constitution by one, it gives proficiency with unarmed strikes, and lets him deal a d4 damage plus a strength modifier with them. It also gives proficiency with improvised weapons, which is going to really benefit this character. The DM decides how much damage the improvised weapon will do, and it is frequently less than a weapon of the same general size, often just a d4, but this character is going to be using some very large improvised weapons. And if your DM is cool about it, something like a log, boulder, or plate mail armored corpse could do a lot of damage. It also allows him to make a grapple as a bonus action when he hits with an unarmed strike or improvised weapon, and this is going to be the guy who gets a lot of benefit from grappling. For those who haven't used grappling in 5e, a successful grapple restrains the target and reduces their movement to zero. A character can also use a shove instead of one of their attacks to knock someone prone, and if a prone enemy is grappled, it doesn't have any movement to stand up with unless it breaks the grapple, and not many enemies are going to be able to get out of the, this guy's grapple. Also in 5e, grappling an enemy doesn't make you prone, unless you have taken the grappler feat and you don't want to do that. It is a terrible feat that actually makes you worse at grappling. So if you have the opponent grappled, you get all the advantages of it attacking a prone enemy without having disadvantage of being prone yourself. As with many of the builds we'll be making from this source book, we are using the Giant Foundling background. It gives the skills Intimidation and Survival, and the Strike of the Giant's feet. It also speaks the Giant language and one of his choice, and he chooses Orcish. When taking this feat, you choose the type of giant that raised you, and that determines the abilities it gives you. Our hero chooses Hill Giant. Once per turn, when he hits an enemy with a melee or thrown weapon attack, the target takes an additional d6 damage of the weapon's type, and must make a strength saving throw or be knocked prone. The DC for this save is 8 plus proficiency modifier, plus your choice of strength or constitution modifier. This would allow him to punch an enemy or hit it with a chair, knock them prone, and then grapple them. When he gets extra attack, he can then hit them again with advantage because they are prone. He could also throw a big rock at them and knock them prone as well. He can do this a number of times equal to his proficiency bonus each long rest. Humans get two plus one bonuses they can put anywhere they like, but they have to be on different ability scores. Using the point by system, we put a 15 on strength, adding one bonus point and the bonus point from Tavern Brawler to make it 17. We put a 14 on dexterity. This will let him get the most benefit out of medium armor and will also help the unarmored defense once his constitution modifier is better than armor. We put a 15 on constitution, making it 16 with a second bonus point. He is going to be I block it with my chest sort of character. 
and a constitution will help with hit points and unarmored defense. For this build, we are going to stick with the unarmored defense for style reasons, but in a game, you will be better off wearing medium armor at lower levels. We put an 8 on intelligence. He was raised by hill giants, so he wasn't given a great education. We put a 10 on wisdom. More would be better, but we don't have the points for it. We put an 8 on charisma. Again, more would be better for intimidation, but it isn't necessary as he's not likely to be the party's main social character. Our hero has no idea how he ended up with the hill giants as a child. He doesn't remember life apart from the tribe, and his foster family isn't really forthcoming about it. Despite his small size, he wasn't treated much differently than a giant child. He was taught to hunt and fight, to throw big rocks, and swing around logs like clubs. As he reached his mature growth, he was no bigger than giant children, and he wrestled in roughhouse with the young giants, building up his strength. The clan was also friends with ogres and orcs, who he could hone his skills against. When he reached adulthood, he began to feel conflicted. On the one hand, he enjoyed his life among the giant clan. Hunting and pillaging were great fun, and he had many friends, but he also felt a desire to learn about his human heritage. So after much thought, he loaded a bag with dried meat, his few possessions, and a couple of nice throwing rocks in case he ran into trouble, and set out on a journey to a human city. A few of his ogre friends accompanied him part of the way, but as they approached human lands, they bid him farewell and returned home. He begins play as a barbarian, and he will be so for the whole build. He gets two skills from the barbarian list, and he takes perception and nature. He isn't the most well-educated, but does know a bit about plants and animals and other things common in the wilderness. He is proficient in light and medium armor, simple and martial weapons, as well as strength and constitution saves. His starting equipment is simple. He carries a war hammer. You could use a maul, but he wants a hand free to grapple. He is accustomed to using anything as a weapon, but he captured the war hammer in battle and is proud of it. Also, for game reasons, he will need an actual weapon. Unlike monks and beast barbarians, he doesn't get an ability that lets his unarmed strikes or improvised weapons count as magical, so he will eventually want a magic weapon. In addition to his carefully chosen throwing rocks, he also carries a pair of hand axes and some javelins. Barbarians have rage. Twice per long rest, he can use a bonus action on his turn to enter a rage. While raging, he has advantage on strength checks and strength saving throws. Grappling and shoving are strength checks, so this is really good. He is resistant to bludgeoning, slashing, and piercing damage, even from magical weapons, so this helps with him with his block it with my chest fighting style, and any attacks he makes using strength deal an additional two points of damage. At higher level, the number of times he can rage and the additional damage both increase. The rage lasts for a minute, but ends early if he is knocked unconscious or ends his turn without attacking an enemy or taking damage. He also gets unarmored defense, allowing him to calculate his armor class as 10, plus his dexterity and constitution modifier. The armor he would likely have at this level is scale mail, and will only be one point better, which does make a difference, but he isn't suffering too much by being unarmored. At higher level, his unarmored defense will be as good or better than wearing armor unless he finds something magical. At second level barbarian, he gains reckless attack. When he makes his first attack during a turn, he can decide to attack recklessly, giving him advantage on all strength-based attacks until the end of the turn, but enemies have advantage on attacks against him until the start of his next turn. This is usually worth doing. Against some enemies that deal large amounts of damage, it can be risky, but many of those enemies are likely to hit him even without advantage. Also, some enemies, like beasts, are pretty easy to hit even without advantage, so it might not be worth attacking recklessly. He also gets Danger Sense, getting advantage on dexterity saves against threats he can see unless he is blinded, deafened, or incapacitated. For our game, we interpret things he can see to include things like hidden traps that he might not see, but can still see the effects of it being triggered and things like fireball cast by an invisible sorcerer. He might not see the caster, but he can see the fireball. When our hero reaches the human city, he's struck by how different it is from home, people laboring at all sorts of strange tasks. Some are familiar, like tanning hides, building shelters, and slaughtering animals, but others are alien to him. People making tiny torches out of wax, or turning little strands of wool into fabric. One trade that he isn't familiar with, but understands, is metalworking. The giants don't craft things of metal, but are more than happy to loot metal things from humans, dwarves, and other races, and their orcish friends do a little smithing and are happy to trade for meat or labor. After a time, he learned that money was important in human lands. He knew what it was, having collected some as loot, and his dealings with the orcs have given him an idea how it works, but he didn't understand how important it was until finding out that he needed it to get food, drink, and shelter. He also learned that it isn't acceptable among humans just to take these things by force, so he decided he needed to earn a living. 
He found a group of mercenaries in town who, who were guarding caravans, and they told him he would receive money, and in return he just had to travel with the merchants and kill anyone who tried to loot them. This seemed a fine way to learn about human lands, so he signed up. At third level of Barbarian, he chooses his primal path, and he takes Path of the Giant. He found that when his rage is upon him, he grew bigger and more powerful, becoming like his ogre friends. Perhaps this was a blessing from the giant gods to protect him while away from his clan. When raging, he becomes large size and his reach increases by five feet. And when he uses thrown weapons, he can add his rage damage bonus to the damage. Here is one of the times when multiclassing could be a benefit. The thrown weapon style would add more damage to his attack and let him draw thrown weapons for free, which could be really helpful when he gets extra attack. But it isn't necessary. Anyone can draw a single weapon during their turn, so if he's holding a thrown weapon, he can throw it and draw another one to throw. And with proficiency with improvised weapons, most anything can be a thrown weapon if he wants it to be. And when he is large, your DM might allow him to throw big, heavy objects that might do more damage than an axe or a javelin. At fourth level, he gets an ability score improvement or a feat, and he takes Vigor of the Hill Giant. Another new feat from Bigby's Glory of the Giants. It lets him increase his strength, constitution, or wisdom by one, and he makes his strength 18. It also gives him two abilities. First is Bulwark. When an effect would cause him to move at least five feet or make him prone, he can use his reaction to steady himself and not be moved or prone. This is handy if someone or something tries to charge or grapple him. The second is Iron Stomach. If he eats food as part of a rest and spends a hit dice to heal, he gains an additional hit point equal to his constitution modifier plus his proficiency bonus. He also gains an additional use of rage each long rest. At 5th level of Barbarian, he gains extra attack, letting him make two attacks instead of one when taking the attack action. Not only does this let him deal more damage, he can also attack an opponent and use his bonus action to grapple them. And if his strike through the hill giant didn't knock them prone, he can use his second attack to shove them down. He also gets fast movement, increasing his speed by 10 feet when not wearing heavy armor. At 6th level Barbarian, he gets another ability from his primal path called Elemental Cleaver. When entering a rage, he can imbue a weapon he is holding with cold, fire, acid, lightning, or thunder, and the weapon deals an extra d6 of that type, and the damage of the weapon changes to that type. Thunder seems a good choice for him, but the other types can be useful as well. And while raging, he can use a bonus action to change the type of damage the weapon is infused with. If another creature is holding this weapon, the property is suppressed. The weapon also gains the thrown property with a short range of 20 feet and a long range of 60 feet, and it immediately returns to his hand after an attack. This would let him throw his warhammer twice per attack action without having to draw a weapon. Now he doesn't need to carry any more thrown weapons, but should keep a few handy for when he isn't raging. And if there are a lot of big heavy rocks in easy reach, he might even be better off throwing them depending on how much damage your DM says they do. He gets another use of rage each long rest. Depending on how many encounters you are getting, this might be even enough that he can rage every fight, but in a dungeon or a really dangerous area, he should still conserve rages for important fights. At 7th level Barbarian, he gains Feral Instinct. This gives him advantage on initiative checks, and if he is surprised, he can act normally as long as he enters a rage before doing anything else. At 8th level Barbarian, he gets another ability score improvement or a feat, and while it's tempting to cap off his strength, and we wouldn't blame you if he did, his armor class is probably falling a little behind at this level, so increasing constitution is a good idea, and the more hit points is always welcome. At 9th level of Barbarian, he gains Brutal Critical. When he scores a critical hit with a melee attack, he can roll an additional weapon damage dice. He gets an additional dice at 13th and 17th level. His rage damage bonus increases to a plus 3, letting him hit a little bit harder. Having traveled far and wide with many caravans, he has experienced many of the strange and sometimes fun things that human civilization has to offer, and has accumulated quite a bit of gold to enjoy them with. His current caravan has ended in a port city far to the south. His companions complain about the heat, and in their chainmail armor he can't blame them, but he enjoys it very much. Being able to pack away his woolen cloak and stifling clothes and walk around bare-chested is a treat for him. The caravan is disbanding here, with the merchants loading their wares onto ships to be taken to far ports, so he's free to do as he likes. After having sampled the pleasures that this tropical city has to offer, he begins thinking about finding other work. He has become friends with a warrior who likes to frequent the same taverns and brothels as he does, 
and says that he is part of a band of adventurers who travel around selling their services to people in trouble or seeking lost treasures and hunting foul beasts. Our hero thinks this sounds like a great deal of fun, and after some discussion, the warrior and his companions invite him to join them. They were a strange group. The warrior was normal enough, a human orc half-breed that was a master swordsman. The others not so much. One was a wizard, which was already strange enough, but was also one of the small folk, a gnome who worked illusion magic. Another was a dwarf woman who was a priestess of their war god. This he understood. He had fought many dwarves and knew their priests were powerful. The last was an elf, the first he had met, and he wasn't overly impressed. The elf was small and fragile looking and always jesting or singing little songs. But it turned out that he was a skilled fighter and a good companion both in battle and in the taverns. At 10th level he becomes a 10th level barbarian and from Path of the Giant he gains the ability Mighty Impel. While raging, he can choose a medium or smaller creature within his reach and move it to an unoccupied space within 30 feet. Unwilling creature can make a strength save, DC 8, plus strength and proficiency modifier to avoid being moved. If at the end of the movement, if a creature isn't on a surface or liquid that can support it, it falls, landing prone and taking falling damage as normal. It doesn't state that you can just throw it straight in the air, but it also doesn't say you can't, so ask your DM. It also doesn't state what happens if you throw it into a wall, but again, talk to your DM. I like this ability. Some mid-level abilities are good, but often don't tie directly into what you're trying to do. This one fits perfectly. Chucking enemies around is a nice addition to his combat abilities, and being able to toss allies to safety or do a fastball special maneuver to toss an ally into position to attack the main enemy is pretty useful too. And since this is a bonus action to use, it doesn't even stop you from continuing to beat your enemies to death, which is your main job. At 11th level Barbarian, he gets Relentless Rage. Now when he drops to 0 hit points, he can make a DC 10 constitution save to drop to 1 hit point instead. He can do this any number of times, but the DC gets harder by 5 every time, so he eventually just won't be able to make it. But the first time is almost guaranteed, and just that is good enough to change the outcome of a battle. That's at least one turn of him continuing to attack, and one turn that no one has to spend an action to heal him. If he can do it 2 or 3 times, the saving an action economy can be enough to give his party a huge advantage. At 12th level Barbarian, he gets another ability score improvement or feat, and he's going to cap his strength at 20 for maximum ability to beat people and throw things, including people. It also makes his grapple very hard to escape, especially when raging, and he also gains a fifth use of rage. At 13th level, he becomes a 13th level Barbarian and gets a second brutal critical dice. He and his friends have had a lot of fun together and gained a lot of loot. They've saved villages from bandits and goblins, he's even fought a few ogres and giants. His friends worried that he might have some qualms about that, but they didn't need to worry. Giants and ogres fight each other all the time. That's just the way of things. Their latest adventure has been less fun. A local baron has been trying to expand his holdings by building dikes and canals to drain a marsh and turn it into farmland, but something keeps destroying his work and killing his workers. The baron has sent soldiers in to find the ones responsible, but they've either found nothing or not come back, so he's employed our hero and his companions to take on the task. So far it's been miserable. The swamp is humid and full of bugs, but the companions have found who the culprits might be. They have frequently been attacked by packs of kobolds and lizard folk, sometimes accompanied by giant alligators that have proven quite tricky to kill. But the party has so far not found whatever lair or base these enemies are operating from. Now they have traveled deep into the swamp and think they may have finally found their quarry. Before them stood something that could be called a building. It was a huge dome-like structure made from fallen trees and mud. Calling it huge might be an understatement. It was the size of a small town, and a pair of trolls at the visible entrance let the party know that this structure was definitely occupied. At 14th level, from Path of the Giants, he gains Demiurge Colossus. His reach increases to an extra 10 feet, and his size can be large or huge, and he can use Mighty Impale to move creatures of large or smaller size. The damage of his elemental cleaver increases to 2d6. This is a lot like other 14th level subclass abilities in that it makes him better at doing what he is already good at, which is exactly what we want. This is not intended to be a versatile character. He smashes the enemy, engages whatever enemy is strongest, and takes his hits instead of his more fragile allies. He can use his mighty impale to aid his companions, but that's about his only support ability, and it doesn't interfere with his main job. At 15th level, he gains Persistent Rage. Now his rage only ends if he falls unconscious or chooses to end it. This is nice if the enemies are fleeing or out of range, and he can't attack and isn't taking damage, but probably won't come up very often. 
Unlike some barbarians, he is also strong at range, so in most situations, if he isn't able to attack, the battle is probably already over. One nice thing is that it says fall unconscious, not become incapacitated. So if he's subjected to whole person or stun or stalled by the command spell, he won't lose his rage for not attacking. At 16th level, he gets another ability score improvement or a feat, and he's going to cap his constitution at 20. Now his armor class is as good as if he were wearing half plate, and he has a massive pile of hit points. With his ability to resist damage, he should be able to stay strong throughout most battles without going down or require healing from his allies. His rage damage also increases to a plus 4. At 17th level of Barbarian, he gains a third Brutal Critical Dice and also gains an additional use of Rage each long rest. At 18th level Barbarian, he gets Indomitable Might. If his total on his Strength check is less than his Strength score, he can use his Strength score instead. This means when he is shoving or grappling, 20 is the least he can get. Of course, with a modifier of plus 5, Athletics Proficiency and Advantage, he will frequently get more than that. At 19th level, he gets a final ability score improvement or a feat, and he's going to increase his dexterity to 16 to increase his armor class a little bit more and to improve his dexterity saves. If this isn't important to you, he could also take the tough feat or something else that would help him in combat, but I like the idea of standing shirtless in a loincloth and being as tough as the guy in plate mail. The adventurers have fought their way through the hive-like structure, having battled hordes of kobolds, many of whom were powerful spellcasters, lizard folk wielding poison weapons, huge reptilian beasts that the elf called dinosaurs, and finally they have reached the very center of the structure, which opens into a cavernous room. Like the rest of the structure, light filters in from outside, and it isn't totally dark, but he still has trouble seeing in the dim light. But the gnome casts a spell that floods the chamber with brilliant sunlight, revealing its occupant, a dragon of massive size, surrounded by a clutch of eggs nestled in the muck that filled the floor of the chamber. The dragon's scales were deep black, and it turns its gaze on the invaders. If our hero expected the dragon to make threats or boast, he was mistaken. The creature belched forth a stream of acid, and the battle was joined. At 20th level, he becomes a 20th level barbarian, gaining primal champion. He can rage an unlimited number of times per day, and his strength and constitution increase by 4 each, and his maximum becomes 24. Since he already had 20 in each, he is at the maximum. His unarmored defense is now 20, and his attack bonus is 13 without any additional modifiers. His damage modifier while raging is plus 7, also without any additional modifiers, and it's a rare being that can withstand his shoves and grapples. This is a formidable fighter at all levels. There is no waiting for the build to come together. He does exactly what he wants to be doing right from level 1 and just keeps getting better at it. He isn't particularly skilled at anything outside of combat, although his survival proficiency will make him a decent tracker, and at higher levels, even with his charisma penalty, he can be very intimidating. But for the most part, he relies on his allies for healing, negotiation, and problem solving. Despite this, he would still be fun to roleplay. A big burly guy who really just wants to drink, fight, eat, and wench. He has a carefree, positive outlook on life and only really gets angry in battle. We hope you enjoyed this character and will tell us about it in the comments along with any suggestions, questions, or build ideas. There are quite a few options with Strike of the Giants to build around and we don't have to do them all, but it would be fun to get build requests from people that we can work with. So please let us know if you have an idea and join us next time when we continue exploring Bigby's Giants. Until then, cheers! cheers.